Okay, so for this module, this is uh, Volcanoes 1. We're going to talk about the basics of volcanoes before we get into the crazy hazards. And so in this PowerPoint slash video, we're going to discuss the different types of volcanoes we get. I'll mention some of the hazards that are associated with each, and we'll talk about why they look the way they do, why are they different, all those kind of things. And then in the module that is titled Volcano 2, we'll focus more on the hazards, like what are they specifically, how do they impact society, how do we mitigate some of those. So that's kind of where we're going with this story here. So um, what I'm going to give you this kind of quick overview here. So this is kind of the story that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about volcanoes. So first is this idea of composition is super important. And so that was introduced. We talked about igneous rocks. So remember the term mafic, intermediate, and felsic are composition terms. In general, we could assign some properties to that, right? So mafic are the dark colored rocks. Why? Because they have a lot of iron and magnesium, and that makes the rocks dark because those make dark colored minerals. Minerals make up the rocks. And so if the minerals are dark, the rock is dark. So that's one thing about the mafic. And then we could say about felsic because there isn't a lot of iron and magnesium. They make lighter colored minerals. The rocks overall are lighter. And then of course we have something in the middle. Now remember there are multiple types of igneous rocks, right? The intrusive stuff, big crystals, and then the extrusive stuff, which is the small crystals. So if we're talking small crystals, we would say this is black in color because we can't really see the individual crystals. So overall, the rock looks black. Felsic looks kind of light in color, so that can be tan or off-white. And then the intermediate would be kind of like a gray. If we're talking intrusive igneous rocks with big crystals, this still would look pretty much all black or mostly black because it'd have a lot of black minerals. The felsic would still have some black minerals. So here we use kind of a percentage. So the low percentage, so there's a small amount of black would be felsic. The kind of 50-50 black and white minerals would be intermediate. And that's how we would loosely identify the composition of igneous rocks. If you were handed a sample and you said, hey, what is this? Big or small? And then we could look at the color and that would help us determine its composition. The other thing that's really important is silica content. So SiO2 is actually the chemical formula for quartz which is a mineral that is made up of SiO2. It's pure right quartz, and a lot of SiO2 is bonded to other elements to make minerals, so there's a lot of SiO2 in the minerals that make up the rocks. But if we compare, the mafic rocks have a low silica content or SiO2 content. There's not a lot there. And the felsic have a lot of SiO2 in their minerals and their overall composition. So we can use that to determine how a volcano will look and how it will erupt, okay? And so here's some other properties that we associate kind of with these compositions, right? So these melt at high temperatures, they have low silica, some of the kind of elements that are there. Here's explosivity, like how violent are they? Here's some volcano names that we'll discuss shortly. And here are some places where we get these types of volcanoes so remember when we talk about magma so magma is the molten stuff inside the earth remember you can't just go into the earth and be like oh look the mantle it's all this soupy liquid no 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 right the mantle at least part of it is hot enough to be gooey we're talking silly putty right it flows but it is not a liquid in order to get magma we have to melt it it has to be a complete liquid right and that doesn't happen everywhere in certain spots, under certain conditions, we can partially melt the mantle. Okay, so another term I'm going to throw at you that we introduce in igneous, but is the term ultramafic. What? So that term would sit up here, just meaning it has even lower silica, even more iron and magnesium. That's what the overall mantle we think is made of. But when these processes occur in the mantle that cause some melting to occur, Remember, the mantle, like all other rocks, the mantle rocks are made of minerals. So not all of the minerals in the mantle will melt, only the ones that have a lower melting temperature. So I don't melt all the minerals that make up the mantle, only some. 
This is what we call partial melting. And that partial melt, when it forms and kind of gathers together, is initially going to be mafic in composition. So we start out with these mafic melts, and this is in general. There's exceptions to every rule, of course, because there's weirdness going on. But in general, when we start out with magma at depth, it is mafic. Now, as it moves to the surface, it can interact with a ton of things, different rock types. It can slowly cool and then quickly cool. It can partially cool and lose some of the you know, minerals and then still be molten. Doing this changes its composition as it moves. And so we can start with mafic and get any of these other compositions. Mafic, intermediate, felsic, all that kind of stuff, okay? So still kind of an overview. And then the last overview I'll throw at you is, of course, remember, where do we get these melts? In general, convergent plate boundaries. There's a process here. Now, this is a picture of a oceanic plate, right? It is subducting under a continental plate. And the, there's a process here that causes the mantle to partially melt. What's its composition here? It's mafic. But as it moves through this material to the surface, in this particular image, it is interacting with a different composition material. This is very felsic. And so I can mix them. Mafic on one end, felsic on the other. I can get something in the middle. That's a possibility. I can also just get felsic. Why? Because I have felsic material. What if it doesn't mix very well, but this material that's rising is super hot, it acts as like a flame, and it can just melt some of the felsic material. And so now I just have a felsic. That's a possibility. There's even a chance that if this is highly fractured, I can allow a lot of the mafic stuff to ooze its way through to the surface without interacting very much, and even get a mafic melt. But... In this situation, in this particular diagram, generally we say when we have a oceanic plate subducting under a continental plate, there is some mixing here and we generally get intermediate type of igneous material. So we get intermediate volcanoes, we get intermediate rocks being formed. Okay. Now if this is an oceanic plate, so I can have two ocean plates collide. We know that from past lectures, right? Subduction happens, <clears throat> I have mostly mafic mixing with mostly mafic, I get mostly mafic rocks at the surface because there isn't a lot of stuff to alter the chemistry of the rocks. Although we can have some cooling weirdness that changes the chemistry so you can get some variety there, just not as big a variety as we would see in this situation. And of course other places we get melting divergent plate boundary. What's the composition of this magma and this lava? Well, we partially melt the mantle, we always get mafic. It rises to the surface here, and it cools and crystallizes, we get mafic. Once again, this is all mafic, so there's not a lot of variability here, because I can't really mix. So I generally get mafic here at divergent plate boundaries. And then, of course, in our last example, did I skip something here? Nope, I like that. Okay, we have hot spots. And so these are sometimes called mantle plumes, and they can form for a variety of reasons. Some are very deep, some are more shallow, but it's this rising mantle material. And because it's rising, it decompresses and it can start to partially melt parts of the mantle. Now, what do we get when we partially melt a mantle? Well, we get mafic melts. But what happens? Well, it depends what's above it. There are times where it's interacting with a continental crust, which is very felsic. I have a mafic melt and I have felsic. I can get almost anything here. I can mix and I can get intermediate. I cannot mix very well and get felsic or not mix very well and get mafic. So I know that can be kind of confusing. So we try in a 101 to kind of put things in buckets and say, look, if you have subduction with ocean continent, guess what? You usually get intermediate. And if you have a divergent plate boundary, you almost always get mafic because there's not a lot to mix with. If you have a hot spot under the ocean, there's not much variability there because the ocean plate is mafic and I melt is mafic, so I generally get mafic. Think the Hawaiian Islands. That's a hot spot under the ocean and I get lots of mafic volcanic material there. 
if it's a hot spot under a continent, now I have some choices here. Typically, because we reference something like Yellowstone, which is a hot spot under the continental crust, what do we get there? We tend to get very felsic material because there isn't a lot of mixing going on, but the hot mafic magma that's rising is heating the continental crust, causing it to melt, and we get a lot of mafic or felsic material there. Can we mix some there? Sure. But that's kind of the, the kind of positions we put these things to keep it more simple. Just want you to be aware that the reality is there's some variability, right? Okay, holy cow, that was a long intro. So look, what we want to do is identify some of these volcanoes, some of their features, and associate them with compositions and things like that. So here's a picture of Mount St. Helens. Everybody's happy. It looks lovely. And then, oops, okay. So we had a fairly violent eruption here. And so would we expect that from this type of volcano? We would. Why? Because of its composition, we know something about how it looks and also about how it erupts. This lava magma in an intermediate volcano is fairly thick, which means that it doesn't allow gases to move through the magma very easily. And so pressure can build. And so why do we have these explosive things? Well, one of the main things is water in the magma. So I know it sounds weird to think that water can exist within molten rock, but Remember, we're not talking about, you know, buckets or bottles of water. We're talking about, you know, microscopic water, water that's attached to different minerals and things like that. It's still water. And so then there's enough of it that it's spread out throughout the magma chamber. That And also pressure, right, is changing when water will turn to steam. And so when we change the pressure, we can change the water to steam. And that takes up more volume. And that is a pressure change that causes explosive eruptions, right? There's also other gases that are trapped in the magma. And because the pressure is high, they can't move until we lower the pressure, they expand. And so then that pushes the material outward and causes violence. And so besides this kind of how much gas and water is in the magma, it's the magma properties. Thick or thin is really what we're going to focus on here. We call that viscosity. And so, once again, the reason that we focused on the compositions was that the compositions influence whether it's thick and gooey or kind of more runny. And so, mafic, we're going to associate a low silica content with what we're calling low viscosity, right? So, a low resistance to flow, which means there's no resistance, it flows easily. So, look. When I have a volcano or magma that is very mafic and I have water and gases in there, they can bubble out pretty easily. There isn't this big, thick, gooey stuff holding my gases and liquid in there. It allows it to escape, and so there isn't a big pressure buildup. So when these types of materials erupt or make it to the surface, they're not super explosive. Now they have pressure and power, so if you've seen some Hawaiian island volcanoes, right, they spew out and you have these lava fountains, right? There's pressure there. There's, it's not like it's not powerful. But rarely do you have very big explosions with that. On the other end of the scale are the felsic materials. These are just the opposite. Lots of silica means high viscosity. So high silica content, high viscosity. What does that mean? It means the gases can escape. So as it moves to the surface and pressure decreases, I have water changing to gas, but it's trapped. It can't get out. I have other gases that expand. They can't get out. And so what does that mean? It means pressure starts to build, right? And then finally, when the pressure gets so great that the rocks above it can't keep it held together, there's a big blast that breaks through the rocks, totally releases all the pressure, and now these gases wildly expand and boom, I get a very violent eruption. So those are the felsic ones. And you might be saying, well, what about the intermediate ones? Well, like lots of things, the intermediate ones can do a little bit of everything. They can have some lower kind of violent eruptions and they can have some higher violent eruptions, right? Usually they're somewhere in between. They have the capacity to be very violent. 
and there are certainly some examples in the geologic past. Mount St. Helen was pretty violent. Now, it was small when we look at the grand scheme of things, but that was a pretty violent eruption. And so they have the capacity to be very violent, so we want to be aware of those. So we're going to kind of look through these volcanoes, name them, and associate them with their composition, and then, like I said, a little bit about their shape, a little bit about some of their hazards is what we're going to play the game with. And so where do we see a lot of volcanoes? Well, the main place that we do see those is subduction. So whether it's subduction over here where an ocean plate meets a continental plate, what would we expect here? We would expect intermediate volcanoes. And that is true because there is some mixing between the mafic melt that starts beneath the continent here, and then it mixes with the felsic continental plate, and we tend to get intermediate stuff. In other places, we can get more mafic stuff, but usually subduction is a big driver for where we get volcanoes. Now, we have hot spots, so over here in Hawaii is the big one. There's some weirdness going over in Iceland, of course, where there's not only a hot spot, but a divergent plate boundary. There are some, now there's volcanism at divergent plate boundaries, no doubt. There's molten material coming to the surface. And there is a, a kind of a, a higher zone here. But because it's, remember, moving away, we don't always build these big, huge volcanoes. And of course, they're not as mm, violent because they're under the ocean. Okay, so, but there are a few that make it to the surface, and those can be violent, of course. And so that's where we're looking for our types of volcanoes. And so our first one we want to introduce is called a shield volcano. So we're going to start mafic and kind of work our way down. So here, mafic, what does that mean to you? You want to think this is non-violent for the most part. So what does it look like? It tends to form these broad, flat kind of features. And why is that? The idea is that as it makes it to the surface, it's pretty runny. And so it flows for long distances. And so it doesn't build typically steep-sided volcanoes. And it looks like a shield, I guess. And that's kind of how it acquired its name. And so we usually get lots of lava flows. Once again, we can think Hawaii. Okay. And so we're not too worried about it being very violent because it doesn't have the power. So it doesn't explode very violently. Here's a crazy human standing next to a flow. Not particularly worried that they're going to die from an explosion. Maybe a hot blob of lava would fly. That would be bad, of course. And so we're not really worried. Where, where do we see these types of volcanoes? Well, shield volcanoes are typically at hot spots under the ocean basins. Now, there's, like we say, there's always exceptions. But it's nice to have a an answer. Like if I said, where do you see shield volcanoes? Hot spot under the ocean. Boom. That's your go-to answer, right? Does that mean they can't show up in other places? Well, no, but in general, that's where we typically see those. And of course, our favorite example is the Hawaiian Islands. So that's what we're looking for. Is this very, we're not worried about people dying from, no, we're not, but we're worried about lava flows. Certainly they can cause damage. We're worried about gases being released and things like that, but not this big violent eru uh, eruption kind of stuff. So we feel pretty, pretty good about that. So here, broad, flat, you can kind of see right? This is the shape. And so potentially, visually, you could make some argument about, you know, what the uh, volcano type was based on its shape. It's broad and flat. Oh, that's probably a shield volcano, right? We even have some little ones here in Arizona. If you drive up from the valley, go into Flagstaff at Sunset Rest Area, if you kind of look to the east, you'll see this little tiny hill. That's a small shield volcano, right? Called Joe's Hill. And so you can point that out as you go up to Flagstaff. So as we move down kind of our scale, right? We were at the top mafic, so low viscosity, low gas content. As we move down a little bit, getting below mafic, but not quite to intermediate yet, we see what are called cinder cones. Now these are shaped differently because there's a little more power here, a little more um, thick, thicker material, so we do get a little bit of a boom, but not a very huge boom. Not that's going to impact hundreds of miles, more local. And that little kind of boom is what builds the shape and size of the volcano. So here we're, we're taking mafic material, 
and we're kind of shooting it out the top of a volcano. And what it does is it, it spreads out the liquid into these tiny pieces as they fly up into the air. And those pieces then solidify, they cool, and they fall back down. Think of like raining pebbles back down onto the ground. Well, because I have kind of a, a spot that's kind of spewing this out, it starts to build a little cone around this area that's spewing out these pieces. And we get cinders, and we get what are called cinder cones. They build up into these, you know, round-shaped kind of conical things. I know what you see over here on the right. It's mostly made up of these little explosions that spew out this material that fly into the air, cool, and then fall back down. Certainly there's some ash, this really tiny stuff that gets up and kind of drifts away. But the main material that builds the volcano are these little pieces that fly up because there's some power here and they fall back down. Okay, And so these tend to be fairly small. Now, if you go up to Flagstaff, there's a bunch of them. And so they're all mafic. How can we tell? Well, the big thing here is color. And that would be true of the Hawaiian Island stuff and the Shield Volcano, right? Those rocks are very dark in color. And that, for our mind, is telling us mafic. So even if we couldn't see the shape of the volcano, we picked up a sample and said, what type of volcano might this be? Well, it could be a cinder cone, could be from a shield volcano, could be from a lava flow, but this is a fairly non-violent event because the color, being very mafic, is telling us low viscosity, generally not very violent, right? And so here's kind of some properties of that and then as we cruise on we can sh once again say there are some examples this is a cinder cone cinder cone cinder cone cinder cone where did these show up mm. all right this is the one that has not a specific home anywhere really so a lot of plate tectonic settings we might get a dominant feature like let's say we have subduction and we're subducting under a continent and we're making intermediate volcanoes. I haven't got there yet. We're almost there. All right. Bear with me. Okay. We can also make little cinder cones. Why? Well, this is that variability that we talked about in general at that plate boundary where you have subduction under a continental plate. You're going to get intermediate volcanoes, but you can get these little cinder cones popping up too because the magma chamber is changing in composition after every eruption. There's new material coming in, all this kind of stuff. So in association with these big intermediate volcanoes, you can get these little cinder cones. They can show up in, um, you know, shield volcano areas too, right? So they're kind of a, a little subset of the main type of volcanoes that show up in certain places, okay? So the good news is your answer for that is almost anywhere. We like that, right? Okay, here's the big one, the one that you hear about the most, the one that we're concerned about the most. These are the intermediate type volcanoes. Okay, so these are stratovolcanoes is a term, or composite volcanoes. Either one is acceptable and they are used interchangeably. This is Mount St. Helens. This is most of the Cascade Range volcanoes. And why? This is subduction related, right? We have a ocean plate subducting under a continental plate we get melting partial melting of the mantle what's that composition it's mafic as it rises up it has the opportunity to mix melt include the felsic continental crust which tends to give us a more intermediate type material and so we tend to get what we call a stratocone or a composite when we have intermediate volcanism so what does this mean it means it's thicker. It means that it's got a higher silica content than our cinder cones, than our shield volcanoes. So it has the potential to be fairly violent. But because it's a range here, one of the reasons the word composite is used is because it's built on what you see here, lava flows and more explosive volca volcanic eruptions. And so it goes through these phases. You can have lava ooze out the top and flow down the sides. But look, it's pretty thick. And so it doesn't run very far and make a broad flat shield. It makes a more kind of pointy, steeper type of volcano. One you think of when someone says volcano and you imagine it in your head, you're like, oh, yeah, it looks like that picture or that picture. And those are intermediate. But because it has the potential to be violent, it can blow up and, of course, devastate part of the area 
but this violence of explosiveness can shoot material up into the atmosphere and it falls back down and builds some of the cone shape of the volcano if it doesn't completely destroy the volcano right and so we have these different types of hazards here because it has the potential for violence yeah we have lava flows do they run really far like in hawaii because hawaii is a more shield mafic runny volcano nope so they don't go very far but obviously they're still a hazard but here I have a explosive hazard. This can blow up and do some damage, right? Throw material a, a decent distance. But in addition, it has what are called pyroclastic flows. So these are just hot ash and material that run down the side of the volcano. Those can go for miles. We've got what are called lahars. These are mud flows initiated by a volcanic eruption. They race down the sides of the volcanoes and find streams and can travel very far. We have ash being thrown up into the atmosphere, really tiny pieces, sometimes miles and miles into the atmosphere. And those drift with the current of the wind and they fall back down in blanket areas like a snowfall. And sometimes it can be just a little bit, but if it's a very violent eruption, you can pile up some pretty steep amount of ash. So it has the potential to impact lots of people because it has a wider range of hazards, I guess, right? That can reach farther out. Now, is it the worst? Well, no, we haven't got there yet, right? So the, the, the biggest eruptions, the scariest ones, are the, the last ones we're going to talk about called caldera types, which are very felsic. But those are rare. These guys are everywhere. So the Cascades, boom, 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 boom. You know, there's 20, I don't know, volcanoes in the Cascade Range. Uh, the Andes in South America, there's, you know, a whole buttload there. <laughs> Right? Everywhere we have these kind of subductions, which we have a lot, we get a lot of intermediate. So although they're not the most violent, there's so many of them and people live near them that they're the ones we kind of focus on and the ones that we're worried about the most because of they're so prolific, right? They're everywhere. So same thing. If you were asked, you know, hey, where would I see a intermediate type or a stratovolcano? We're thinking subduction right we're thinking one plate subducting under the other and here's this example of the cascade range right these are all kind of volcanoes boom 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 boom. these are all intermediate okay and so this is kind of where we think once again can i get something that's a different composition here yes there's variability can i get our favorite cinder cones here sure they can show up here um but the dominant amount of material being erupted here is intermediate because of subduction. Now this other stuff, this, this green stuff, that's not related to subduction here. This is another issue we can talk about later, but it's not related to the Cascade Range here, okay? And so these are volcanoes we're talking about, right? And there's volcanism in other ways, shapes, and forms. Big. These are called flood basalts. And so, um, but here we're kind of focusing on volcanoes. So these would be the stratos. Once again, intermediate composition, why subduction is usually the place we see them. They have a range of violence from not too bad to pretty darn bad, right? Where we're worried about them and they impact society. And they have a, a huge range of hazards. Mud flows, pyroclastic flows, ash fall, lava flows, uh, all these things we were concerned about. And those are the things we want to mitigate help fix, help keep, you know, to a minimum, we talk about in the in the next module, right? Okay, what else I got for you? Oh, Arizona, are you kidding me? There are, Arizona's got everything. There are actually composite volcanoes. There is this one here, San Francisco Peaks. If you have gone skiing up in Flagstaff, you are skiing on a composite volcano. Intermediate, for the most part. Now look, there are also cinder cones all around San Francisco Peaks, kind of to the northeast of the San Francisco Peaks. There's basaltic, right, very mafic lava flows in this area. So it's rare you're going to find an area just has one thing and nothing else, right? Because this variability of the eruptive material, it changes after each eruption, all that kind of stuff. But this steep-sided kind of feature indicates a intermediate type volcano. And in theory, the argument is that the peaks, if you see this picture here, probably extended up to a kind of more point like a pier, but this material was blown out kind of like Mount St. Helens, a very violent eruption. 
no longer active and all that kind of stuff okay so there's an example in Arizona and just to give you some relationships so here's our intermediate kind of the size of these features that we see right compared to a cinder cone look how tiny that is but if we were going to take this lovely intermediate volcano like Mount St. Helens or Mount Rainier and plot it against you know a shield volcano we can see even that size and the shield volcano is so big just because it's runny the the lava and the tear coming out is very runny and can run for long periods or long distances sorry and so that's why they get this broad flat shape okay um I'm not sure why that's there but it just it's illustrating where we get volcanism right divergence uh, we get uh, hot spots we get subduction all that kind of good stuff okay Oh gosh, I forgot about lava domes. No, I didn't forget. They're here, um, and we got to talk about them because they they're we're moving down the list to our um, from Mafic all the way to Felsic. So Felsic here, we have uh, these things called lava domes. How do we know they're Felsic? Look, the rock is very light in color, a very low amount of Mafic minerals, so we know that this is very Felsic. It has the potential because we know it's thick and gooey. It could be violent, but in this case um, they they vary right so um, it depends on the gas content if there's a lot they can be but they're typically smaller features and they're usually in association with an intermediate type volcano and so here you can see that this dome is in a crater but the overall feature this is an intermediate volcano so what is happening here it's that whole idea of the variability of the magma chamber yeah we get these eruptions because we have an intermediate style but after we erupt we change the composition of the magma chamber maybe it shifted a little felsic and so now i get a felsic eruption now it shifts a little bit more to the mafic so there's some variability here they tend to show up in association with these intermediate and this little blobby here that's a dome that's a lava dome okay right here lava dome right there lava dome what's the hazard here the hazard is not that it's going to blow up because the explosivity is kind of low. Why? Because of this. You usually have a low water gas content. The hazard is that they are unstable. They're so thick and gooey that they form really steep sided little domes that can collapse on themselves. And then they tumble down the mountainside and they form what's called a pyroclastic flow. And of course, that's bad. And it has some speed to it. It usually doesn't travel super far. But that's one of the bigger hazards here. So where do we see that? There's some variability here, um, typically in a convergent plate boundary because it's usually associated with intermediate. I don't have a dome for you in Arizona, sorry. Now, the last one uh, we're going to talk about is what's called a, we're going to call it in this class, a caldera-type volcano. What does that mean? Well, the reason we're going to use that terminology is because the term caldera is really just a descriptive term talking about a collapsed feature. You can get a caldera in other volcanoes. Okay, you can get them in intermediate. It's a feature. It's the it's the crater at the top of the volcano. So you can either get the crater from an explosion, right? Like Mount St. Helens blew its top, and we have a crater. Or from a collapsing of the volcano. So why would the volcano collapse? Well, the story is that in this image here, you see a magma chamber down here. As that magma chamber is pumping material out of the volcano, it's removing magma deep in the earth and creating basically a hole, a pocket, that can cause the overlying material to collapse down into it, forming this crater. And so the term caldera does and is used to describe this collapse feature. What we're going to say is, yes, that's true, but there are these certain types of volcanoes that are called caldera type volcanoes that are so massive that the only thing that's left of the volcanic event is this huge collapse feature. So it's not a small feature at the top of volcano. It's a feature that encompasses this huge area that's 10, 20 miles across, and it has obliterated most of the evidence of a nice steep-sided volcanic system because it was so violent and why was it so violent because of its composition so here we have something very felsic 
but there's a lot of dissolved water and gas in here. So usually when we talk about things like this, we reference Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a hot spot under the continental crust. And in this particular case, there's some melting going on, but ultimately you're ending up with a big magma chamber that's full of very thick, gooey magma that's very felsic and a lot of water and gas dissolved, which means that it can't escape. And the pressure in this huge magma chamber is enormous. And so what happens here is when there is an eruption, it is so violent and there's so much power that you empty almost the entire magma chamber, which is fairly large, and you get a huge collapse after the fact. These are super violent. They have the potential to be you know, planet altering and the material they eject can affect climate and a huge area. And so there's evidence that Yellowstone has erupted very violently in the geologic past, produced a huge amount of material, you know, places where there's tens of meters of ash piled up from material being ejected out into the atmosphere and then falling back down, right? So these are, and of course the material stays in the atmosphere, blocks sunlight, and it can have a pretty big impact on our planet. So these are the scary ones. And of course, if you watch Discovery Channel, they're telling you we're all going to die from Yellowstone or something like that. We've never seen, humans have never experienced to our knowledge, a super volcano eruption, which is what these caldera type eruptions are related to, right? And are associated with. We have evidence. Oh, crap. Here's some, you know, here's some volcanic material that we can tie back to Yellowstone. Chemistry helps us with that, things like that. So we can say, wow, this, this material was all came from this source and it covered, you know, hundreds and thousands of square miles, half the continental U.S. That would have a big impact on society if that happened. So we know that they exist. We know that they can happen. They're not as common, of course, as our intermediate. So we focus more of our energy on the intermediate volcanoes and how we can mitigate those hazards. We talk about the caldera types in awe and like, holy crap, that would be amazing if that happened and horrible at the same time. Um, but these are the, the, the big super volcano things, the stories you may have heard or read about or watched videos about, right? So it is why, 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 why? Well, composition, right? Very thick and gooey and lots of water and gas dissolved. That combination is a problem. And how do you know? that it was felsic. Look, it's light in color, right? Light in color. So this is potentially ash deposited. Look how thick that is and how many layers that is. That's a lot of material coming out of a volcano and falling back down into layers. Of course, it's been squished and altered because it's, you know, been through some stuff. But this is a lot of material coming out of a volcano that has an impact on our planet. But you can look at it and say, hey, this is light in color. This is felsic. This might be from a very violent eruption, right? So you can, just by looking at its color for us at this level, we can make some interpretations about that observation. And yes, believe it or not, there is a couple actually um, examples of calderas, the superstition mountains. Like, and here's this example. If you looked, if you're from Arizona, I apologize if you're if you don't know anything about Arizona, but in Arizona we have this mountain range called the Superstition Mountains. If you go out there, uh, there's a man-made lake plopped in there. If I said, point to me, where's where's the volcano? There's no steep-sided volcano that we typically associate with volcano shapes. Why? Because this thing blew its top, exploded, obliterated most of the features associated with a nice, you know, steep-sided volcano and collapsed into itself and form this rugged terrain. Of course, it's been beat up too, because it's, you know, 17 million years old. But these are layers here of ash deposits that exploded out and fell back down and kind of formed these layers. This is the remnants. This is how we know there was a big violent eruption here, because we can look at these and say, oh, they're volcanic. There must be a volcano here. And we look at their composition. Oh, they're very light in color. They're very felsic. Where's the volcano at? You know, we start to piece things together and come to this conclusion that this was a big caldera type eruption, super violent, lots of collapsing, lots of obliterating of the topography, lots of material ejected, lots of deposits of stuff. It's a bad day if you're around this area for sure. 
Okay, so those are all calderas. Oh, all right, so we're back to this. So those are the volcano types I want you to be aware of, okay? And this is the same thing I introduced. The, this is what we've learned, right? There's shield volcanoes, there's cinder cones, there's stratocones, there's calderas, and there's domes. In general, we can walk them down the composition scale. Shields are up here in Mafic. They have low silica, so low viscosity, not very violent. They tend to form in these hot spots under the ocean, also in some divergent plate boundaries. As we move down the composition, we get cinder cones. Where are those guys? Freaking everywhere, <laughs> right? So, all right. Intermediate, here's our main kind of volcanoes that we see in the world today. Why? Because of convergent plate boundaries and subduction. This is where we get the melting partial, melting of the mantle, the rising of that material, the mixing, all that good stuff. And so we get stratocones or composite, that's acceptable. It's in the middle of our you know, silica content percentage, which means it can be down here a little bit and not be very violent. It can be up here and be pretty darn violent. And so this is how we build our intermediate. It's the typical shape. And as we move down to the felsic composition with high silica content and a very high viscosity, we get these little domes, which we kind of, you know, a little side note that kind of pops up here and there. Yeah, okay, but the caldera type volcanoes, ooh, we're scared of those. Those are the big super volcanoes. Those are the ones that do lots of damage. Why? More power, right? There's more explosiveness here. That power has the ability to eject much more material out. So if it's out, it's either in the atmosphere and it's causing havoc there, it's falling back down, causing havoc there, or explosions are racing the material outward from the event and causing hazards there. This is where our big super volcanoes are problematic for more people, but they're rare. So do I, am I worried about this killing everybody or these? For now, it's these because they're so common, hundreds of them around the planet and they're erupting all over the place. So I'm always monitoring and I'm always concerned about these. Okay, concerned about these and these make for cool stories and great videos and things like that, but they're, they're rare and they don't happen very often. Right, and so that's going to put that in perspective. All right, and what else? Just wrap it up. This is from your igneous rock lab. We can do the play the game, right? These are the rocks that we should see associated with our felsic types of volcanoes, rhyolites. Why? Because these are the stuff that's to the surface. It gets to the surface, it's fine grain, it's small crystals. So I should see rhyolites if I'm looking at felsics. What if I'm looking at intermediate volcanoes? I should see andesites. If I'm hiking Mount Rainier, I should see andesites or somewhere in there, right? There's dacites and things like that, but it's intermediate. What about if I'm on Hawaii, I'm looking at a shield volcano. I should see lots of basalts. What color should they be? They'll be dark black, right? Because that's what I expect. So we were taking these things, right? Color, shape, size, and we can even talk about like we just did where these come from. What's causing the melting here? Why is there a volcano here? We can explore that because we can look at the composition and we can associate that with specific volcanoes, specific features, specific hazards, eruption styles. That's the game we wanna play. That's what we wanna figure out. All right, so that's what I'm expecting you to kinda of know about this module. And then next module, we will talk about more of the hazards, right? We'll investigate each hazard as it associates with the, the typical um, different volcano types okay hopefully that was helpful and um what else i think that's all i got for you so if you have any other questions and you want to reach out to me please feel free to do that